Coming up on The Sporting Chef. Today, I'm at a game feed. Hank's making schnitzel. Melissa's doing her thing. Stacy's dealing with the chickens. C-Dub is making something that'll stick to your ribs. And Buddy is going green. What do you get when you find the best fish in game chefs? Cookbook authors, award winners, fishmongers, outdoor experts, and put them on the fastest half hour on outdoor television. Hosted by one of America's best known wild game chefs, Scott Lacey, The Sporting Chef. Brought to you by Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors. I'm headed into the house, kitchen, and bar right down the street from the Capitol in Sacramento, California. Now, this is a group of people that get together two or three times a year and they put together game feeds. It's clean out your freezer, it's free, and the House Kitchen and Bar hosts a lot of these events. Very often it's associated with a fundraising group like the California Waterfowl Association. California Waterfowl, I've been a member of for about 20 plus years. They do a lot for conservation, wetlands preservation, and the heritage of duck hunting in California. You know, at one time, I used to have a bar restaurant here in Sacramento, California area, and we would do the same thing. People would bring us their game, we'd cook it for them, show them what it's supposed to taste like. First off, I want to talk to Chris Nestor. He's the chef owner. I've known him for a while. This man can cook. Let's see what he has to say. Chris, I got a menu here. Yeah. What's what's the deal in general with what you do here? Um, actually, this is this is something we've been doing for about ten years now. Um, it's just it's not we don't do it too many times. We probably have maybe twenty of them. But what it is is it's it's a chance for the guys in the kitchen to cook something that's totally different that we don't do on our everyday menu. Right. Um, it started off with a couple friends that uh, had some ducks. They brought them in. We cooked a couple dishes. It just has turned into now something where like it's like a hundred people. And would you say that the people here are they are they hunters and anglers or are they just people uh, hunters all the way all hunters okay. yeah there's a few personal friends that may not be hunters but uh, I think they're coming down just to experience what the game is gonna be like but I'd say 90% of them all hunters well and you and I both know that we've changed a few minds from people that have decided yes the game tastes like liver and mutton right. and all that kind of stuff and then they go wow this yeah. is pretty good and before I get too far into this I have Hank Shaw who actually may be here tonight making antelope heart schnitzel. What, you don't eat the antelope hearts? For a lot of the guys I know, the heart is one of the best parts of the animals that they bring home. But I do know that a great many other hunters just don't eat it at all, and that's a shame, because all a heart is is just meat. You can do what I'm gonna show you right now, and that is to open it up like a book, pound it thin like a schnitzel or a cutlet, and then flash fry it, kind of like chicken fried steak. The way to do this is to take the heart, this is the heart of an antelope, and you take a sharp knife and you find that gap right in one section of the heart. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take that and you're gonna cut around it to open up the heart like a book. And you're using the heart's natural structure to open it. Don't worry what it looks like now, it's gonna be pretty in a minute. And you can see there's a little bit of sort of veiny stuff and a little bit of blood here. What you wanna do is you wanna trim that as best you can with a sharp knife and then wash it really nicely. And as you can see, it's pretty flat, but there's a thinner part and a thicker part. And what you wanna do is you wanna even them out and tenderize the heart all at the same time. The way you do that is you put it between plastic wrap or in a Ziploc bag. Now you wanna put it on the plastic wrap so that there's plenty of room on either side. You're gonna to wanna to pound it with either a rubber mallet from your toolbox or with a meat mallet. This is about an eighth of an inch thick. Take the plastic wrap off. And there you go. This is tender and it's thin and it's gonna cook in a heartbeat, so to speak. You don't have to trim it, but it makes it look prettier if you cut off all the ragged edges. Okay, so I've got the heart cutlet and I'm gonna bread it just like a regular Italian cutlet or a schnitzel or chicken fried steak for that matter. It's flour, then beaten egg, then breadcrumbs. You always wanna season it first. A little salt, a little pepper, flour, get it good and coated, Shake off the excess. Run it through the egg, both sides. Let it drain a little bit into the breadcrumbs. And now into the hot fat. Now you wanna let this cook for a good two minutes. See how nice and brown it is? That's what you're looking for. As you can see right there, there's a little bit of the juice that is coming up through. That tells you it's ready to rock. 
That is a pretty classic German schnitzel. Made with a heart. Who knew? So this is pretty much the calm before the storm. Uh, the chefs are getting everything ready. People should be here very, very soon. And uh, I've got a guy you might recognize who's got a tip on how to make your waterfowl taste better. Brining is basically a mild salt water solution that in the proper proportions of water to salt, it will pass through the animal and leach out the blood and replace the blood with a mildly salty brine. Now, I happen to have here a duck that was not brined before it was vacuum packed in the food saver. All right, so I have here half cup each kosher salt and brown sugar. And I'm gonna add that to my half gallon of water into the brine goes the duck. After it's thawed, let it sit in that brine for at least six to eight hours. And the victory here is this water is gonna look very bloody and the duck is gonna taste much better. Don't forget, brine every duck and goose before you cook it. Coming up on The Sporting Chef, we've got ducks, elk, and a whole lot more at the house, kitchen, and bar. Melissa Bachman, Stacy Harris, C-Dub, Miguel Valdez, and Buddy. Welcome back, I'm Scott Layseth, The Sporting Chef, and I'm at a feeding frenzy, or about to be at a feeding frenzy at the House Kitchen and Bar in Sacramento, California. Um, earlier I talked to Chris Nestor, the chef owner here, about what's on the menu. What do you got here? This is today's okay. menu, right? Yeah, so what happened was we got, uh, we got an ice chest dropped off on Thursday. Uh, we went through it, we found out what we had enough of to make a portion wise, and then we just started making a menu. Duck bites, what they've done is they've, uh, we've marinated in some soy and ginger, it's still raw, wrapped it with a little bit of bacon. We're just gonna uh, bake them really fast, get the uh, bacon crisp on it, the inside hopefully is still on that rare side. Elk meatballs, where we just straight meatballs with a creamy uh, Cajun sauce. We have elk sliders, just what they are. We we had a little bit of the enough just to make some small hamburgers, and so just to let it taste just what it is. Nothing changed in it. Salt, pepper, that's it. Right. See, we make fried rice here all the time. I think we make pretty good fried rice. So it's just an accompaniment to go with it, some sort of filler to go with all these dishes right here. Right. So then we have some wild turkey. Uh, we call it an S&S, &S. that's our sweet and spicy. So we're just gonna make them into basically uh, chicken strips, but turkey strips. Right. So we're gonna bread them, a little bit of buttermilk, seasoned flour, deep fried. Okay. Uh, bass nachos, we're, we just, we took the bass, we, first we cooked it off with just a little bit of Old Bay and some seasoning, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring it back in our wok with a little bit of soy ginger. And what kind of bass is this? Is um, it, is it bass. sea bass? Oh, sea bass. So the braised elk, I think that's the only piece of braising that we actually had. Normally we do have a lot more braising meats because of the bigger game. Um, so we have this with uh, some potato cakes where you deep fry our some potato cakes, a little bit of breadcrumb on the outside. Fish tacos, we're gonna use some of the bass as well. We'll put some mango salsa on it, a little bit of cabbage. Our bolognese, you can see is right here. Uh, that's been cooking all day. So it's, it is a very hearty with some polenta. We got some fried polenta to go with that. And then we have the, just the straight duck breast that we're gonna serve medium rare. It's rare, it's our rare, medium rare, um, with the uh, with some mashed potatoes. And what's this deal here? Yeah. What's that? So we have one piece of, uh, just one actual mallard that we cooked for uh, Marty. He's actually one helped us kind of basically put this whole thing together. So what we have here is we have this uh, one mallard we did. It's with a uh, cherry barbecue sauce. So uh, hopefully he likes it. He's put enough work into it. I think we did a little extra just for him. So I um, hope everybody enjoys it. And here's Melissa Bachman. A lot of people think that calling in a black bear with a predator call is simple, and it can be if you follow a few simple rules. Number one, you need to know their senses. They can't see very well, but let me tell you, they can smell and they can hear. So make sure every time you do a stock that the wind is in your favor. This will cut their sense of smell down and it will also cut the noise back down as well. Now for sight, you can move right in on these bear. If they see you, simply stop. If they don't see any movement, 
they'll go on with their business and usually they're feeding on grass flats. Now my favorite way to use a predator call is when you can see the bear. When you've made a perfect stock, maybe it starts getting a little too noisy on the shore, but you can still see the bear, that's the best time, in my opinion, to hit a predator call because you can watch their body language. It's the exact same way as if you were calling in a whitetail, hitting the rattling horn. If you could see that, you know if it's working, whether to keep going. Same with a bear. You hit that predator call, you can see if he likes it, if he hates it, and if he comes running, the more you call, the harder he might run. So keep blowing that call till you're out of breath. Now, if you do bust a bear and you try to get in and maybe he smells you or hears you, don't use the predator call. It's one of the worst times to do it because all you're gonna do is educate that bear that something just busted him and now he's hearing supposed screaming of a baby deer, I doubt it. He'll know that for the rest of his life and he'll probably never come to a call again. So make sure to use those calls smart, but when they work, let me tell you, they work. Now, Melissa Bachman obviously knows what she's doing. I've got a guy here that you know what you're doing, don't you? Marty is one of the organizers of this whole event. I've known Marty for a long time. Marty, who are all these people? Most of my guys are up, up Rancho Marietta. Right. All right, so bring them down on the bus. That is north east north, of north, Sacramento. Northeast of Sacramento, gotcha. right, about 30 miles away. And so all this game that you've got gathered up here, and did you, did you happen to shoot any of this at all? Zero. Did you get out? Zero. Did I you probably, any with an errant golf ball? All the geese I brought back well, I understand. from Canada. What's the deal with the one with the duck with the cherry something? Is that that's your deal? The right? cherry bomb? Yeah. The cherry bomb was a, a little bit of a Japanese enclosure deal that you know, like you throw it in a pond and then right. you get them, and then whatever floats right. up. Right. Exactly. So, and what's in the recipe? I don't cook. I shoot and I kill. So really, not a whole lot has changed here with Marty. <laughs> okay. I want you to turn to the camera and say, next up, it's Stacy Harris. Okay, next up, Stacy Harris. See, that wasn't so hard. One tip that I have about raising chickens is always feed them your table scraps. I like to feed them table scraps because they get extra food, they get extra vitamins and extra minerals, and then when we get their eggs, we get that extra food, extra vitamins, extra minerals right along with them. I just got these fresh eggs. There's nothing better than fresh eggs, especially alongside of some wild game. My tip here is not to wash these with soap and water unless you plan on eating them within three days or so. Because if you do, you know, they, they go bad faster. If you don't, it's got what's called a bloom on it and it protects it for weeks and months. You can keep these in your refrigerator. If you notice that your chickens are laying eggs with thin shells, all you need to do is to bake the shell in the oven for about three to five minutes and then break them up into tiny little pieces and feed them to your chickens and it'll give them calcium. And that's what they're deficient in and that will help them to create hard shelled eggs. C-Dub, Buddy, and more from this feeding frenzy in just a few. Get in there, do your thing, Thanks. try the food. It looks amazing, and I actually have tried this, this sauce. I don't know what and it that's is. That's the bolognese. I think that's elk bolognese. It's amazing. Excellent. And now here's Cito. You know Cito. Okay, today we're going to make that old classic breakfast, biscuits and gravy. We do this just like we're in camp. We've got all of our dry ingredients right here in a uh, food saver bag, our salt, our baking powder, and our flour is all in here. And we need about two-thirds of a cup of uh, 
vegetable oil, and then we're going to use a cup and a third of buttermilk. We want our dough to be slightly tacky, and then while our biscuits are baking with our charcoal there, we'll go ahead and make our gravy. Pat that out to a uniform thickness. We want all of our biscuits to cook at the same time. We're not going to need that. So we're gonna just get all of our biscuits in. Our charcoal's almost ready. So we're using a 14 inch Dutch oven. So we're gonna start with a circle of briquettes. It's about the diameter of our oven. And we're gonna set that right over that charcoal. That's our bottom element. I'm going to put quite a bit of heat on here. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go all the way around that outside edge. We're gonna go back over to our stove and uh, get another Dutch oven up and start making us some sausage gravy. This is off a uh, feral hog. And so we made this sausage last night. And we're gonna put it in here and we're gonna start browning it. Okay, we've got our sausage all browned and crumbled up. And I'm gonna add about Oh, a little over a half a cup of flour. We're going to start by adding some milk. And what's going to happen is this cooks, it's going to get thicker. We're going to add some pepper. I'm not going to add much salt to this gravy because we have some salt in our sausage. And then just to give something, you know, a little different twist, I'm going to use just a tiny bit of high mountain seasoning, steak seasoning. As it gets thicker, we add a little bit more liquid. Okay, we're gonna get a couple of biscuits here. Okay, we're gonna go over here and we've got our homemade gravy, our made from scratch gravy from a feral hog sausage that we made last night. Add a little hot sauce. And there's breakfast, Scott. Wish you were here. You know, not only do they have uh, wild game here, but you have you had any of those? Is that your first beer? That's You're just getting started, beer right? Today. First beer today. First drink here. Now, for those of you that may have watched the Dead Meat Show, this is Jack Morris who, um, how did you like the python? Do you remember the python in the Dead Meat Show? I didn't like the python. Huh. How about the armadillo? Did you like I didn't the, like the armadillo. The crow was good though. Didn't you really like the crow? I didn't like the crow. I so, like the carp. I like the carp. The carp. The carp. Carp cakes were good. And I think it, I think this is a carp free event here at the house kitchen. I just wanted to check in and make sure that Jack had plenty to eat. Stuffed. It's been wonderful. <laughs> now while Jack and I get a little something else to drink, I want you to watch Miguel Valdez, who's gonna show you the easy way to de-vein a shrimp, and then he's gonna cook them. You know, Scott, a lot of people have the misconception of how to clean a shrimp. It's it's tough, but right now. I'm gonna show you a way to do it very simply and easy. Um, I was taught a long time ago, you, you grab it from the bottom by its legs and you peel back. You peel off the skin and then you gotta put them in soak them, and soak them in water right afterwards just to kind of keep them cool because you don't want them sitting there and then getting warm afterwards. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring my knife, bring it across the back. This is where they have their digestion tract on the back and you wanna take that off. This is where all the gunk and nasty stuff's at gonna clean it off and there you go nice and clean and it take me no time at all now what you're gonna do is you're gonna get some salt and some pepper always salt and pepper with all these make sure it's at a high heat start hearing that sizzle while that's going I'm gonna throw some butter in there and then what you're gonna start doing is you're gonna start caramelizing it and basting it I call it basting just like you do a turkey just gives it all the flavor but also cooks the top evenly and these are radishes and you can eat the greens on these, it's awesome. Gives a nice color, a nice texture. Get a little salt in there. A little bit more butter. And see the, the greens wilt down like spinach almost. It's, a, it's awesome. You know when your shrimp is cooked is when it starts shriveling up and you don't have a transparent look to it. And you'll be able to tell by looking at the back of it. And if you see right through it, through the inside of the shrimp, it's not cooked yet, all right? And this is how you devein a shrimp. So obviously there's a lot going on here. It's starting to heat up a lot. Um, there's a little bit of drinking and a whole lot of food here at the house kitchen and bar. And here's a guy who's no stranger to wild critters. It's my buddy, Buddy. Okay, it's Buddy to you again. We're gonna talk about some guacamole. 
Just the regular stuff, avocados, some onions, some tomato. And to that, I'm going to put a little bit of this high mountain season, this trail dust. I'm going to put a little bit of garlic pepper. I'm going to squeeze some lime in there. This is what's going to make it special. I'm going to put a little bit of olive oil in there. Take some of this diced jalapeno. We're going to put some sour cream in there. You mix in that olive oil. You're going to mix that sour cream around on them avocados. Them avocados ain't gonna turn black, and they ain't gonna turn black for like two, three days. It's still gonna be that pretty green, and that little bit of jalapeno in there for a little bit of white, and drive them evil spirits out of your body. I gotta get out of here before I get into too much trouble, but I'll see you back here in just a minute or two. So I gotta get out of here before I get into too much trouble, but I'm guessing that here at the house kitchen, they changed a few minds about what fish and game tastes like. The food's really good, the people are having a lot of fun, and I wanna thank Hank Shaw, Stacy Harris, Melissa Bachman, Miguel Valdez, C-Dub, and of course, Buddy. You're watching The Sporting Chef, I'm Scott Laysath, and I hope to see you next week. Oh, 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 oh.